The most merciful thing in the world, I think, is the inability of the human mind to correlate all its contents. We live on a placid island of ignorance in the midst of black seas of infinity, and it was not meant that we should voyage far. The sciences, each straining in its own direction, have hitherto harmed us little, but some day the piecing together of disassociated knowledge will open up such terrifying vistas of reality and of our fight frightful position therein that we shall either go mad from the revelation or flee from the deadly light into the peace and safety of a new dark age. <laughs> Hello everyone, welcome back. Welcome to episode 2 of Tales from the Quill with me, Mark. And I hope so much you're all doing very well and I hope very much you also enjoyed our first episode. Today, of course, we have something special for you and I'm joined by a special guest to discuss their favourite author and an author who was quite new to me as well and I've only read one of their works but I found the subsequent conversation that you're about to listen to very very interesting and it made me definitely want to check out more from this author he's the writer of such works as the dunwich horror of the mountains of madness the whisper in darkness the shadow over innsmouth and the call of cthulhu which was the piece you heard quoted in the beginning so by now you may probably have worked out who it is we're going to discuss we are going to discuss H.P. Lovecraft, and I've been joined by that inimitable booktuber, Michael K. Vaughan. So sit back, relax, and enjoy. So Michael, thank you so very much for coming in today to talk about Howard Phillips Lovecraft. Of course. Thank you for having me. <laughs> it's an absolute pleasure. Um, I suppose I wasn't too surprised when you said that this would be the author you'd talk about, at least, you know, at least this on this occasion. Um, and I suppose before we begin, maybe looking at his life, I wonder if you could tell a little bit about how you came to know H.P. Lovecraft. Well, the first time I ever encountered Lovecraft was through a paperback, which was called The Tomb and Other Stories, if I'm remembering correctly. It was just a paperback reprint of some of his stories and not even his best known stories. And I encountered this when I was a little kid and his writing was way beyond me at that point. And I, I wasn't quite grasping everything that he said and everything that he was talking about, but I knew I liked it. You know, I knew I loved this. I, I, I liked this stuff, even though it was, it was obviously beyond me and I knew it, but I mentioned it to my stepfather. And then a little while later, he picked up at a bookshop in San Francisco, a full set of Arkham house, the Arkham House edition of Lovecraft, which was four volumes, and I still have it, and it's on my shelf. And that's how I really got into Lovecraft. I read those over and over and over again. And uh, yeah, he's and you he's, and you still you still read him, right? Oh yeah, I mean, you still read them. He's he's very rereadable. Mm -hmm. And uh, I remember being surprised when I read his stuff because I just. I had read of him. I knew about him, but I didn't realize that he wrote more than just horror. He wrote a lot of fantasy stuff and he wrote the dream, the dream series, his, his, his dream stories and a lot of stories that were influenced by Lord Dunsany. Yeah. And I had never read anything like that. And I had never expected, I didn't expect that from him. And he just wrote a lot of interesting stuff. And was, I mean, was he a gateway for you to other authors? Because I noticed he was, you know, it, as I said to you earlier, before we started, I, I read uh, Call of the Cthulhu. Sorry, it's, I, I, it's so difficult to know how to say it. I had to kind of look it up uh, earlier. And like the, um, 
is it epigraph is it what do they call it the, the, the little poem or little piece at the beginning mm -hmm. is by arthur Ma uh, machen uh mm -hmm. who i know you also like and then i realized as well through my reading that he um you know, had had uh, some was influenced partly i suppose by the likes of algernon blackwood as well mm -hmm. and also yeah. as you said lord dun dun and say um did you know these guys before or was lovecraft like the no lovecraft was definitely the gateway to those guys i knew horror when i was younger through stephen king mm -hmm. and that kind of thing you know i was reading it in the 80s the paperback from hell boom <laughs> and a lot of those guys were much different and so when I discovered Lovecraft and he had, he wrote a essay called Supernatural Horror in Literature, where he discusses all of those guys, Arthur Mack and Blackwood, all those guys. Mm -hmm. And that's how I found out about all of those writers. The problem was, is that at the time when I was reading this stuff in the 80s, books by those guys were hard to get. You know, it was, it was before the internet and basically if you found them at the bookstore, that's the only, that's the only way you would get them. You know, mm, I guess mm. there were mail order outlets you could try, but you know, I was, you know, I wasn't going to do that. No. And so, you know, they were impossible to find some of this stuff. Um, nowadays we, we live in a much better world for that kind of thing. Anything we want, we can get basically. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, especially if you don't mind, obviously the eBooks you can get, mm -hmm. you know, all these guys are on, um, you know, Project Gutenberg or, or whatnot. I, I did believe there there are there are some issues which maybe we'll come to later. I think over some of Lovecraft's work in terms of like who owned them, mm -hmm. whether whether they're all in the public domain or not. Some of them are not because he collaborated with people who maybe obviously lived longer or that mm -hmm. kind of thing. So, um, but it's but it's interesting you mentioned Stephen King because again, I, I'm sure King probably cites his own experience of Lovecraft as some kind of influence on his work, perhaps. So. You know, oh, yeah, he's definitely. kind of like the the linchpin or the the middleman between those before him, like Blackwood and and and, and Machen, and then obviously people like King uh, after him. So it's kind of cool. Well, he, is, he is the most important horror writer of the 20th century. You mm -hmm. uh, you could point to King, but King is not the most mm -hmm. important. As mm -hmm. good and as influential as he as he is, it was Lovecraft because uh, Lovecraft changed everything and he he did something with horror that was completely different at the time it, it, it's hard to imagine now because he's been so copied and he's been so influential that a lot of the stuff that he did is very uh, familiar to us now but it, it certainly wasn't at the time where mm -hmm. he was he was moving from supernatural horror which is what he started with and he was moving into science fiction but it was a peculiar kind of science fiction because it was still horror but he was just using science fiction as his way of telling terrifying stories yeah. well i was wondering that actually because uh while reading uh call of the cthulhu there's moments where they start talking about you know beings that are older than the earth and i think at one point it refers to them as star people and i thought well that that sounds almost science fiction uh to me so yeah well yes. yeah call of cthulhu is a science fiction story mm. about an alien basically mm. because there were there's a lot of talk about gods in hp lovecraft mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but the gods that he's talking about are, are only gods to humans Right. Mm -hmm. So you have mm -hmm. the Cthulhu, they have the Cthulhu cult who have been worshiping Cthulhu forever. Right. Mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. he is an ancient alien. Mm -hmm. Aliens came down to Earth before human beings were ever around and were worshiped as gods by people, because that's the only way we could understand these beings. But they but they are aliens. And, and is that was that something quite new then? Because obviously now, I mean, with things like. I don't know, maybe something like uh, the fifth element or something like that. You know, we, we it's nothing new for us to know that, you know, maybe aliens were worshipped as gods or aliens built the pyramids, you know, all this mm -hmm. kind of stuff. So Lovecraft's usage of this kind of, I don't know if trope's the right word, but it, it was something new. 
it wasn't original to Lovecraft, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but it was a new thing in fiction, certainly. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And the way he did it was just really kind of clever. And that was, you know, the whole Cthulhu mythos idea, which he did not invent. Mm -hmm. That was a term invented by August Derleth, who was mm -hmm. a friend of Lovecraft mm -hmm. and who wrote a lot of Cthulhu's mythos stories based on Lovecraft, which Lovecraft was fine with. Um, Oh, it was done during his lifetime. Some of them were. Okay. Uh -huh. um, mm -hmm. He and, you know, Lovecraft was friends, pen pals with people like Clark Ashton Smith mm -hmm. and Robert E. Howard and a lot of mm -hmm. the other writers at the time. And they would use each other's characters. And so, the, like, if you read Conan by Robert E. Howard, you will find Cthulhu references in the first Conan mm -hmm. story. Okay. Uh -huh, uh -huh. And uh, Lovecraft would use names from Robert E. Howard's stories and Clark Ashton Smith's stories. And it, the idea was kind of to, to give, an, give a sense of realism in the story. And so in the story, so people who were reading them were like, well, you know, is this a real mythology? Yeah. You yeah. know, is, are they, is he making this stuff up or is this, you know, a real thing? It wasn't yeah. a real thing. It was just uh -huh. them making things up. But. Lovecraft it's so, really it's so clever. Yeah. Just and so were, clever. And having them all interlinked like that as well. It's uh it's 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 wonderful. And I wonder, um, let's let's go back a bit. Let's go back and look at you know, perhaps his early life. We've already mentioned some of his influences, but I know that um, you know, as a child, I, he was quite, you know, he learned to read and write pretty quickly. He was obsessed with Greek mythology, apparently, and this kind of things. But you know, he was he was born in uh, eighteen ninety, and what do you know about like his his family uh, situation when he was born? Well, he had a he had a happy childhood before mm -hmm. his teen years, um, and uh, he was well off. The family was well off because his uh, his mother's side of the family had money, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and. He had a really idyllic kind of childhood. He was he was a genius. He was really smart. Uh, he found all his grandfather's books in the attic at, when he was very young, and that's and he read all of that stuff to death. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. that really influenced his his thinking and his writing. But then his father in 1893 went insane and was confined to Butler Hospital almost certainly due to syphilis. Although that is not something that anybody would admit. And we don't even know if Lovecraft really knew that or mm -hmm. not. Mm -hmm. But that's almost certainly what happened to him. And so his father was confined away to Butler Hospital for years and just died in that hospital. Lovecraft's mom was always a little on the edge, you know, uh, she was she was one of those very loving but also very domineering kind of mothers, it seems like. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And at at one point, due to bad business or uh, there was a catastrophe mm -hmm. and Lovecraft's grandfather lost all his money and suddenly they were struggling and had to move out of the childhood home where Lovecraft had grow grown up. And that was a huge shock mm -hmm. to Lovecraft. And it was the great tragedy of his life, you know, because suddenly he was, he no longer lived this idyllic existence. And from that point on, they become, they became poorer and poorer. Mm -hmm. And to the point where, where Lovecraft, when he was an adult, lived in absolute poverty and died in poverty. And, and, you know, he didn't, he didn't earn very much at all, did he? I mean, he couldn't no. have lived off well, what he wrote, so. Yeah, his, his, his problem was is that he just wasn't geared as a human being to getting work, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He was only really interested in writing and mm. reading and writing and, and of, of a very peculiar kind of writing, too. He would, and for, for him he was an, an amateur artist, so to speak. He didn't like his stories to be edited or changed, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which was just normal if you were writing for the pulps. Mm 
Uh, and so he ended up when he was an adult doing a lot of revision work, uh, editing other work for clients mm -hmm. and things mm -hmm. like that. But, but certainly when, when he was younger, uh, just that catastrophe, it, it always affected him. And he, he went into kind of reclusion in his teenage years. He mm -hmm. never finished high school. No, I mean, he, he spent quite a lot of his youth ill as well. I mean, he was quite a sickly, a sickly child. He was, although a lot of that was probably psychological. From his mom. Yeah, yeah, but it's hard to know because mm -hmm. he never wrote about that period, really. And so mm -hmm. that's the period of time we know the least about Lovecraft. He got out of that through amateur journalism. At the time, there was this thing, amateur journalism, in the days before the internet or anything like that, mm -hmm. where people would publish their own stories and they'd publish their own magazines, these mm -hmm. little amateur magazines. And there were, there were a couple organizations and Lovecraft got involved in that. And that pulled him out of his reclusion. And suddenly, through amateur journalism, he started making contacts and making friends and getting involved in the world again. And that's where his early writings were. And, well, that's where some of his early writings appeared. He had his own amateur journal, The Conservative. Yes, because he was very conservative. <laughs> very conservative, yeah. yeah. And uh, that changed, but when he was younger, he, he th that's the way he was. But uh, a lot of his early work appeared in these am amateur journals, and that's wondering... basically. Yeah. Sorry, I, yeah, I was that's... wondering uh, actually when you say that because his his grandfather had a rather interesting name. Is it Whippy or Whipple or something like that, I think? Yeah. Um, but his middle name's a Van Buren. And I wondered if how common it is, whether it's related to the to the eighth, pre was it eighth president? I'm trying to think back to my Seinfeld with the Van Buren so. boys. Yeah. No? So. Oh, okay. Mm. Would have been kind of cool. <laughs> I think I would have remembered that. But. Yeah. Well, it didn't say on, you know, yeah. when, I, when I was looking online, but I wondered. Because I know, obviously probably read like you know his life story through st joshi and, mm -hmm. and and whatnot so it's probably more on that than i can gather from you know online looking and wikipedia and that kind of thing but yeah um so so his mum's uh so his dad's uh his dad's locked away in, in an asylum mm -hmm. he's living with his grandparents he's uh he's afraid of the dark isn't he uh which was kind of interesting i was reading something like he was afraid of the, the dark so i think he, they said his grandfather's cure was to basically make him walk through the house in the dark mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> so, you know could be a bit traumatic and i Lo yeah Lo lovecraft a whole, had a whole catalog of fears <laughs> one of the reasons he was so good at what he did well yeah because you've got to th i mean as i said i my own experience with lovecraft is very very narrow you know it's basically the call of the cthulhu and, and which i read or finished rather uh this morning but it it is disturbing and i was thinking when i was reading it you know if he's putting out all this kind of stuff and when i realized that, you know that there's so much of it in terms of these rather terrifying uh novellas or short stories or whatever you have to wonder what what's going on inside the minds of people like that you know i don't know what you know how and and, and how much again is his you know as you said he 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 had a lot of fears and probably these things manifested through through nightmares as well, I think I read uh, a lot of the times. You know, but he had a nice childhood. Okay, yeah. he had a bit of poverty, his mom, yeah, but it wasn't like they were completely impoverished. You know, they weren't destitute. They just probably weren't as genteel as they had been before. Mm. You know, how how overbearing is his mom? I'm just trying to think, you know, where 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 are these nightmares really coming from? Well, that's hard to say. You know, um, because you're, he wasn't he certainly wasn't abused as a child. He never mm -hmm. experienced any of that kind of suffering. Um, he Like he had a good childhood and he had friends when he was a kid. Mm -hmm. But he was also very sensitive. And so anything that did go wrong really kind of crushed him. And so 
and and that's why moving out of his childhood home was so terrible for him and mm. so traumatizing actually mm. and he just had a hard time dealing with things that a lot of people have no troubles with you know social situations and that kind of thing he was he became reclusive when he was younger he did get out of it though and he actually became very sociable as an adult he had a lot of friends they, mm. they hung out all the time i mean he had he had his own literary circle didn't he yeah he did yeah. named after him <laughs> so. well he was once he started writing his talent was just so clearly superior mm. to so many others particularly in the pulps he wrote for for the pulps but he was never really a pulp writer his stories mm -hmm. appeared there because they could appear nowhere else. Mm. Uh, he was writing at a time when there was just no outlet for that kind of weird fiction outside of the pulps. And so Weird Tales was just kind of a natural home for him once he started publishing professionally. And was it super popular? I'm guessing maybe not if he didn't earn a, a living from it. I mean, was it really kind of a, a cult thing? Like, Yeah, it was. It was. Uh, if you look at if you look at the popular literature at the time, horror was just a small part of it. It was a part of it, but it was a small part of it was not respected at that time. You know, he, there was the era of supernatural literature in, in the Victorian era where mm -hmm. ghost stories and that kind of thing were, it, it was not considered trash, mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. By the time of the 1920s and the 1930s, it was kind of seeming that way. Mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. it didn't help that so many of those pulps were just so trashy, you mm -hmm. know. Yeah, yeah, because I, I suppose, I mean, I don't know how very early horror or supernatural stories were received when I, when I say, or even gothic. Because, uh, I mean, he cites, I think at one point, he says, you know, he can't really lay a finger on his earliest experiences but he 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 believed it was probably the likes of Anne Radcliffe and mm -hmm. um uh Charles uh, Maturin and uh, Matthew Lewis of course mm -hmm. who, who actually read all three of them last year um and um I'm assuming they were kind of fairly mainstream for the mm -hmm. time and then yeah. I don't know how mainstream the likes of Blackwood or um or uh Machen were um but then it seems like you know the the horror you know it, it seems almost sad if uh, at the time the the most influential horror writer of the 20th century is writing horror is a really small um and that's you know, that's exactly what it was i mean horror was kind of going down at that point mm -hmm. the 1940s was you know he was going into the 1940s which was like the down period for for horror fiction and yeah, and, that, and that's all he was interested in writing was weird stuff. He wasn't mm -hmm. interested in writing in anything, writing anything else. I don't think he could, you know, it was, that was just his, that's all that interested to him as far as writing goes, other than letters of which he wrote, a, you know, a staggering amount and mm -hmm. travel logs. He traveled actually a lot mm -hmm. and uh, he did a lot of travel writing, but as far as fiction, yeah, it was it was all weird stuff all the time. And there was a lot of changes in his fiction, but it was always weird stuff. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And of course, his his chief influence, other than Lord Dunsany, was Edgar Allan Poe. Mm -hmm. And you see a lot of that in his earlier fiction. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, he uh, I think I also read somewhere that um, going back to his nightmares, this kind of started around the time of his grandmother's death, maybe, um, because he was quite close to his grandmother, I believe. Yeah, well, he had a lot of childhood nightmares. And so it's, it's yeah. kind of hard to pin down exactly what the cause was. But the effect is certainly clear. You know, he used, he used his dreams, like the night gaunts, which factor so heavily in the dream quest of Unknown Kadath, Mm -hmm. came straight from his dreams these faceless winged monsters and i mean they just and he had a lot of dreams like that that just he would wake up he would remember them and he would use them mm 
I wonder like what that like did to him really I mean you can't I mean he must have seen monsters every time he closed his eyes I'm amazed he slept you know? he saw monsters every time he opened his eyes <laughs> because <laughs> I mean one thing that we we haven't touched upon yet is his racism which was a which was part of his upbringing uh he he came from a household that was a racist household not just against particular races but immigrants as mm -hmm. well any kind of immigrant and you know he wasn't he wasn't so much hateful as terrified mm. he was frightened of almost anybody that was different than he was if you had a different background if you were from a different place if you looked different if you acted different he was scared of you and as he grew older he was resentful because when he went to new york all of these people that he felt superior to they seemed to have no problem getting jobs or functioning in society mm -hmm. or just dealing with life and he did he had he had all of those issues but he's from, I mean, he's from a small place, isn't he? I mean, I mean, Rhode Island is, is the smallest state, isn't it? And, mm -hmm. um, you know, it, and, and I think they said that he, he just didn't like anybody who wasn't yeah. English or English ancestry, which was basically yeah. his, own, his own people, as he, as, as it said. So, yeah. Know. And so he, he used that xenophobia and when he was writing he put that in his writing only instead of people he was using monsters mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but he did see monsters everywhere he looked you know and it took him a long time to get past those fears and and that xenophobia and he never completely did mm. because he was i mean it wasn't even just like racism was it i mean he was he was I don't know if classist is the right word, but certainly if people's economic situation or the type of class they were, he he didn't hold much truck with people from lower classes and, and that kind of stuff. So, yeah, I mean, he doesn't sound very likable at all, really, does he? <laughs> and yet he was. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he was. By, yeah. by all accounts, everybody that actually knew him thought he was a great guy. However... Yeah, his prejudices, his prejudices did affect some of his friendships over time. Mm -hmm. um, but, I'm guessing not the racial ones, though, probably. Well, the thing that caused him the most trouble, I think, with his with his friends was his anti-Semitism, oh, okay. which is odd, considering he married a Jewish woman and a lot of his friends were Jewish. But for him, for Lovecraft, if you assimilated into mm -hmm. his idea of society mm -hmm. you know if you started acting like us and not them mm -hmm. you were okay you know yeah no it it's was, true it was, i read that it was a peculiar thing and his wife said to him hey these people that you're always talking about they're my people <laughs> and he says yes but you're you're one of us now <laughs> you know yeah, because I think they said something as well about the, when he would refer to um, people of color who had who had done good in the world, who'd kind of pulled themselves up in terms of the social class that they they functioned. Even he would refer to them maybe as honorary members of his group, despite mm -hmm. still not really liking them. But now it, his wife isn't interesting because he he marries late. Mm -hmm. He spends so much time surrounded by quite probably intimidating women because you know he's he's he he lives in his grandparents house where he's close to his grandmother his mother uh dotes on him but also has this weird kind of controlling thing over him as well she by bizarre twist of fate ends up with in the, not they don't they don't cross over do they the father's no, already they... dead but they she, she ends up in the same mental hospital as as um as her husband or his father she did and and by this point he's living he's he's what is he he's he's i don't know definitely late 20s or maybe even early 30s mm -hmm. isn't he and he's living with his aunts yeah it's not normal well there's a lot of now anyway <laughs> but yeah and it's it's interesting because 
when his mom passed away, <laughs> suddenly he was free, you know, and you can sense that in his letters at the time. He would never say, oh, thank goodness my mom's gone and now I can do what I want. <laughs> but there was that sense, you yeah. know, where now he's he ha there's a sense of release and a sense of freedom. And he was just unburdened, mm. you know, at that time. And he wasn't the type of guy that should have gotten married <laughs> because he had no, he, the responsibility of being married, he wasn't ready for and never really was. He wasn't the most romantic fellow in the world. He had practically or probably no interest in sex at all. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He was just different in that way. And so he was, he was not putting himself in a great position when he did get married, but you know, he did and it was unsuccessful. And was it uh, unsuccessful to the point where they actually like fell out or they remained amicable? Do you know? Cause she, she outlived him. Like, yeah. Like, and like, it, it he doesn't sound like a great guy to be married to, frankly. Um, they they moved to New York, and she she did all the work because he could not find a job. He did look, he did try. He was unsuccessful. Uh -huh. um, she tried to start her own business and it failed. And he was the type of guy that would always have the friends over, you know, and he'd go out with his friends literally all night long, and you know. <laughs> he was that type of guy. Yeah. And eventually, just to survive, she had to move someplace else where the work was. And he didn't go. So they separated. But they were still married. But Lovecraft came to hate New York. And all he wanted to do was go back home to Providence. Mm -hmm. The relationship was not working out. Because he just didn't it became obvious that he preferred to be alone. He just wasn't, you know, I, he didn't have anything against his wife. There mm -hmm. was no hard feelings that way. She felt resentful towards him, ended up burning all of his love letters that he wrote to her, unfortunately. So we lost all of that, which would have been really, really interesting. And. It might be terrifying. They, yeah. And, and eventually <laughs> they, you know, got divorced but mm. it just he just he just couldn't no and is there i mean uh, you know as you know his works is there any shift or change in the writing he does before marriage during marriage and then post marriage yeah there there is there is a difference um before he got married, that's when he wrote a lot of his fantasy stuff, a lot of his Dunsany stuff, a lot of his work that is clearly influenced by uh, Edgar Allan Poe, even though all of this stuff is Lovecraft. He had a very distinct, distinctive writing style. He had a very distinctive way of writing. Everything he did was his own, although the, the influences were pretty clear. Mm -hmm. When he was married, he went through his New York period, which was his grim period. That's when he wrote uh, The Horror of Red Hook, for example, which was mm -hmm. his his most hateful and racist story. And he was just, it was a grim time. Now, when he went back to Providence, however, when he escaped all of that, that's when his writing really took off creatively. Mm -hmm. And that's when he wrote his best stuff. Uh, all of the major Cthulhu mythos stories that we think of. That was all written when he returned home. Mm. And uh, I mean, he, he, he clearly came out of that New York experience and just was like, ah, I'm free at last. <laughs> it's kind of funny that he's had to declare that twice, at least in yeah. his life, you know, with obviously the death of his mother and then uh, the, uh, the ending, of his, ending of his marriage. Um, Going back to his work, uh, you mentioned earlier on about um, sci-fi horror. Mm -hmm. and is it, but by this is what we, we, we term, or I see termed in relation to Lovecraft, what, it, what is termed as, sorry, cosmic horror. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the idea that, you know, he's, he's looking at things from the perspective that human beings are very small and puny in relation to the universe. Yeah. And that 
and that is pointed out by the beings and the horrors which these human beings stumble across, which are so vast and so dangerous. And to and to these entities and these beings, we are just kind of nothing, you know. Yeah. And that is where the horror comes in in a lot of his work, just the vastness of the universe and our very precarious place in the universe. Well, because he was, I mean, he was very interested in astronomy and things, wasn't he? Uh, yeah, he had a good grasp of of the size of things and also uh, of the vastness of time. Uh, you know, he he understood deep time, the idea that of just how old things actually are. He had a good grasp of that. And he was a very rational person. He was an atheist. He didn't actually believe in anything supernatural at all. Mm -hmm. Thank thankfully otherwise he would have been and he would have probably ended up in the same asylum as his parents <laughs> maybe yeah <laughs> and uh you you see that come out in his work the fur you know the further on in his career earlier he was writing a lot of the supernatural stuff he was always interested in the weird and the the unusual and the frightening Mm -hmm. Fear is always part of his work. But gradually in his work, he, as he was he was moving into what we know now, we now think of as the Cthulhu mythos, all of all of that stuff is science fiction in, in one way or another, for the most part. There were there were mm -hmm. there were a couple stories where it edged on the supernatural, like uh the the Duns with Horror, for example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But mostly what he was writing is science fiction and uh his his monsters were clearly aliens for the most part and you mentioned uh you know his his uh his wife burning his his letters um i think was it st joshi estimated something that he probably wrote something in the region of a hundred thousand letters or there would have been a hundred thousand letters uh, available and i think I don't know if he said a third or a fifth, I can't remember, actually survived. So that's that's still a lot of, it's a lot. of his correspondence yeah. out there. Um, do you know off the top of your head some of the luminaries or people that he did correspond with at, at the time? I mean, I think Robert E. Howard, we mentioned. Yeah, there were a lot of other writers that he, mm -hmm. would, that he would correspond with um, and other people that he knew from when he was in amateur journalism. Um, but he would correspond with a lot of the writers that we know, like Robert E. Howard and Clark Ashton Smith and um, Donald Wandry and and a, and a bunch of a bunch of other people. And a lot of those letters survive, thankfully. But he would write all kinds. of I mean, he wrote all sorts of people. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, he wrote letters to people we'll we'll never even know all the, all the letters that he wrote. But fortunately, so many survive. And he was so forthcoming about his life and his activities. Mm -hmm. He is one of the most well-documented writers around. And so it, it's it's funny sometimes when people think he was some mysterious figure. We know everything about him because he told us. There are only a couple periods of his life and we don't know much. But for the most part, you know, you can go day by day in his life and know what he was doing because he recorded everything in those letters. Which is funny because, you know, he wasn't, super popular maybe only among the readers of weird tales i suppose in terms of an audience he was relatively unknown really in his lifetime by by the general public it seems that he was only kind of rediscovered you know after after his after his death yeah um and it it, it took a little while i mean the, the people who read his stuff knew how good he was and his fellow writers knew how good he was. And uh, August Derleth and Donald Wandry opened up Arkham House, their, their, their small publishing venture, specifically to reprint H.P. Lovecraft in hardcover. That was their whole goal. Eventually, they expanded quite a bit. Uh, and for years and years, Arkham House published some of the greatest supernatural and science fiction books around and they're very very sought after today all of those books 
but it was specific, it was specifically to publish Lovecraft in the beginning. And that helped keep him alive. But again, he didn't really become really, he was respected and people, people knew that for this kind of thing, he was an influential and important writer. But it wasn't until the 80s, really, and going into the going into the 90s that people started to realize that not only was he important in, in supernatural and horror fiction, he's just a really important American writer. And it wasn't until he got into the Library of America that it was like, oh, OK, he's arrived. When he, <laughs> when he was published in Penguin and then the Library of America, it's kind of undeniable. OK, he's not just. He's, he's not just important as far as this genre. He's just an important writer. Mm -hmm. But yeah, that was I mean, a long process. I, I, as I say, I can't really comment uh, much on, on his writing style after having just read one work by him. But, you know, it is probably his most famous, I suppose, isn't it? That and mountain, The Mountains of Madness, mm -hmm. I suppose, are the two ones that I knew without, you know, uh, I, the, the works of his I knew before I knew him, if that makes sense, mm -hmm. kind of thing, before I knew much about him. But it, it's an interesting style, actually. And um, it it seemed, in some ways, it did seem familiar to me, the style, but I couldn't I couldn't really put my finger on it. I, want, I wanted to say that maybe there are, but I, maybe it's doing him a disservice to say there was like, maybe a few hints of 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 doyle maybe in in at least in this story uh maybe that's a disservice to lovecraft if he's kind of carving out his his own style but it was it was very readable and very very disturbing actually i have to say i i, I found i found it, it 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 surprised me i don't know why it, I, you know i'm not a big one for horror anyway i'm not a big science fiction reader either um but i enjoyed this and it's certainly given me um you know uh impetus to, to 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 check out obviously his his other works as well especially after having uh spoken uh with you um do you see the influence of the people we mentioned the likes of uh lord dunsey or uh algernon blackwood in his writing or do you think he has really carved his own style as it were well he he did carve his own style everything he wrote was was his thing mm -hmm. but mm -hmm. you know as a writer you're going to be influenced by the people that you read he certainly read every book sir arthur conan doyle ever wrote mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. he was a sir arthur conan doyle fan and mm -hmm. when he was a, when he was a kid he was a huge sherlock holmes fan and so it's no surprise you would see Doyle in Lovecraft. His chief influences, like I said, were on his work were Edgar Allan Poe and, and Dunsany. Mm -hmm. And he developed his, his style young, although his style changed quite a bit as, as he grew older. He became kind of a master at his style. He would use his ornate language and all the weird words. And he's just his his purple prose you know his it's his prose style that's suffered the most hits mm -hmm. over mm -hmm. the years but he became he he became great at using that style to create an atmosphere of horror and unease and uh by the time that he was writing his 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 best stuff from the call of cthulhu onward he he knew how to use that style and he mm. changed quite a bit in his writing. When he was when he was younger, the the horrors were always indescribable, and and you know they were a noble, indescribable things. <laughs> and by the time he got to at the mountains mountains of madness, he was vividly describing every single thing about these monsters uh, scientifically, you know. And it was it was it was quite a change. It, it was quite a development in his in his style, but I think it works for him. Well, I mean, he he. I suppose one of his legacies, uh, which we'll come to towards the end, is is that 
he has his own adjectives. I mean, Lovecraftian is a thing. Yeah. So, I mean, that's that's usually a symbol of, you know, being a master of your craft. Forgive the uh, <laughs> pun there, but yeah, it's uh, it's 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 fascinating. I mean, uh, so we mentioned, you know, his his kind of limited literary success outside people in the know. He got posthumously famous, as you say, when he goes into um, uh, the Library of America. How much do you think he's in danger now with the controversial issues surrounding his attitudes to, to race and um, people's backgrounds? You know, given obviously the kind of climate uh, we're living in, is he in danger? No. Do you think? No. I don't think so. I, I... We are living in, in that time, you know, but I think that this is a temporary thing. Mm -hmm. We're going through this cycle, like when in the 1950s, when they went through their fearful cycle, every, mm -hmm. every once in a while, something terrifies people and they have to suppress it or, you know, freak out about it. And, you know, we, we now have the censorship of authors where publishers are terrified of putting out any kind of work or book that has anything that might offend anybody. And certainly there are offensive things in Lovecraft, but you know, that, that's most writers. I mean, as, as, as racist of, as Lovecraft was, he was never as racist, for example, as Jack London, but mm. nobody cares about Jack London because Jack London isn't relevant. And mm -hmm. most of Jack London's work is not read. I suppose one one saving grace for Lovecraft is he 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 was horrible about everybody. So <laughs> yeah, he was, he was so xenophobic. That's it. Yeah. <laughs> you could argue that he's actually very inclusive it, in his dislike of everybody. Yeah, he was afraid of everybody. Um, <laughs> but you know, I don't think he's in danger because he's just too clearly important. You mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. because he. He took his influences and created something entirely unique and different mm -hmm. at the time. Um, not, not all of his ideas, like, like I said, were unique to him, but what he mm -hmm. did with it was unique. And you can't take that away. No. You know? And you can edit all the books you want. His stuff is almost all in the public domain. Everything that he wrote on his own, outside of collaborations, I believe it's all in the public domain. Mm -hmm. And as long as it is, it is to an extent untouchable because we all have access to that, which is fortunate. Um, well, I think it's, yeah. it, it's interesting as well, because obviously with your uh, booktube channel, you know, you, you, several occasions you, you mention him, you talk about him, you keep his name probably more alive than anybody else, at least in the booktube that I, that I watch. And, you know, you have a, a good following that, that does something. I'm sure you probably, you have probably introduced Lovecraft to, you know, a few people since you started um, booktubing, you know, which, which, which can only be a positive thing, even if it's five people that had never heard of him before, mm -hmm. but, you know, come to watching your channel and thought, yeah, this guy sounds really interesting. I better, I better check him out. So, that's you know that that that's definitely a positive that we you know you can keep you know nobody's nobody on booktube is talking about jack london you're right he's not relevant or at least if he's talked about maybe they just talk about call of the wild or something mm -hmm. but not not uh not in this in, in 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 this scope so going back then he's moved back to providence he's left new york and he's moved back in with his aunts mm -hmm. <laughs> which i which i but again, he's not living in poverty. I mean, it's quite a nice house they're living in, you know. Um, well, he 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 slid into poverty, right? Because the the money that was left over from when they had money was depleting, right? Mm -hmm. The older he got, the less there was. So by the time that he was, you know, in his late thirties, it was. It, 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 it was tough and 
he was practically starving himself mm -hmm, mm -hmm. because he would rather spend money on books and food. And uh, they were, I mean, it, it was rough going. If, if you read his accounts of what he was eating, it's, it's amazing. He didn't die sooner as it was, uh, his cancer that he developed was probably in part due to his horrific diet. Yeah. Well, it was, it was uh, intestinal, wasn't it? Intestinal cancer. So mm -hmm. could, could well be. Could well be. Um, he's, you know, I, I was amazed to find out he was friends with Harry Houdini. <laughs> so again, it shows that he has this kind of like really interesting, diverse friends list, you know? Yeah. I mean, Houdini is a foreigner, isn't he? He was a Hungarian. I don't think he was born in America, was he? No, yeah, he was Hungarian. Um, interesting, you know, but then of it course... Sadly, yeah. of course, Houdini dies. They did. They, they, didn't they? They wanted to do some kind of project together, didn't they? Well, he wrote, he ghost wrote a story for Houdini uh, for mm -hmm. Weird Tales. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. that was the basis for their, uh, for their knowing each other. Uh, Houdini came up with an idea for a story. And that's all it was. It was an idea. Lovecraft wrote the story. And Lovecraft took this idea of Houdini's and just turned it into this crazy thing. <laughs> and uh, it's under the pyramids. I, God, I think that's what it's called, under the pyramids. And uh, it's a great story. Mm -hmm. And it's clearly all Lovecraft, but he's writing it as if it's Houdini because it's a first person account from uh -huh. Houdini uh -huh. where Houdini is uh, trapped underneath a, pyra a pyramid. He's, you know, he's trapped underneath a pyramid and he has to escape, but he comes across all of these horrific Lovecraftian horrors. And it's a great story. Mm -hmm. Clearly not written by Houdini, but it's just, <laughs> it's fun seeing Houdini in a Lovecraft story. So now he's writing some of his best work back in, back in, in Providence. Um, his wife has moved to California Mm -hmm. she remarries even though she doesn't realize it she's actually not officially divorced yeah <laughs> she doesn't know and she was very disturbed when she found out yeah as far as she knew he signed papers everything was good yeah no. that's that's a weird thing but then of course you know it's you know he's as you say he's sliding towards poverty but he's not alone i mean this is the period of the great mm -hmm. depression it is um and this is when his views start to change isn't it from being you know right wing very concerned. much so i mean they 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 took kind of a 180 and he he went from being super conservative to um almost socialist you know in his his viewpoints and as he grew older a lot of his attitudes changed um and there was at least that about him, you know. We mm -hmm. we don't know if he had lived longer, if all of his attitudes would change, and and suddenly he would, you know, not be racist anymore. We we don't know. Yeah. Um, but certainly, a lot of his right wing and intolerant at attitudes certainly soften a great deal, and you can see that in his in his writing later on. Mm -hmm. um, so they become right wing monsters in, in later on. Uh... <laughs> well, it's interesting because as he became less fearful, and he did, he became, through all of his experiences, he became less xenoph xenophobic. He became less fearful of other people. Mm -hmm. He became more accepting over time. And part of that was the depression, his, him realizing that his, these attitudes that he had were old fashioned and no longer relevant. Um, it's hard to change political attitudes, but he did. Um, part of it was travel, being exposed to different people. Mm -hmm. um, all of these things are just gonna change your outlook over the time. And that is reflected in his stories. Monsters, which always reflected other people or the things that he was afraid of, he started to relate to his monsters. Suddenly his monsters weren't as frightening. By the time you get to At the Mountains of Madness, mm -hmm. you have these monsters in the story, which are terrifying, 
But as the story progresses, you realize that these monsters are actually an advanced civilization that have this extraordinary culture to the point where he says, well, yeah, these are alien creatures, but they're men, Mm -hmm. you know, they're Mm -hmm. people, which is really kind of startling. Yeah, it's interesting. Interesting to see that kind of development, and it's it is it is uh, a curious thing to wonder, you know, had his life not been cut short as to where mm-hmm. he would have gone through it. Because, you know, if he had lived through the Second World War, for example, where he would have seen, um, uh, probably, well, uh, I would say a more extreme version of his views put into some horrific practice, it might well have given him even more pause for thought. That perhaps. Well, he originally, you know, admired Hitler. Well, know, Hitler first fair, though, a lot of people, but to be fair, a lot of people did in, yeah. the, in the early 30s. But later on, he started hearing reports of the horrors of Nazi Germany, and mm-hmm. it very much disturbed him. Mm-hmm. Um, so he did start at the end of his life. He started to learn about the realities of that kind of hatred. Mm-hmm. And that kind of intolerance, and uh, it it did affect him. Mm. Not to say that it completely changed his views, but it it would not surprise me that if he had lived, it would not surprise me if he had lived longer, if his views would change, mm-hmm. um, because he already showed by the time he was in his forties that he was the type of person that could change. His attitudes could change. There are some people that are just so inflexible that they will never change at all. Um, And he did. His philosophy changed, his ideas changed. He was intelligent enough that he he was able to adapt and change a lot of his attitudes. Whether those specific attitudes would would have changed, there's just no way of knowing because he didn't live long enough. He he died relatively young. I mean, he lived to see a uh, publication of, I think, the final work he does in his lifetime, which is The Shadow Over Innsmouth. Is that right? Mm-hmm. But he's not very happy with it. Um, he believed it's like... Uh, well, that was, that, was the, that was the story where he was experimenting. He was trying to write that story in a different style. And that proved very difficult for him. And also, like a lot of his work, it was rejected mm-hmm. twice until it, it saw publication in a independently published book. It's crazy, and, isn't it? When you think that he's written all this stuff before, mm-hmm. he's getting things published, at least in this magazine, and still now he's in his you know mid to late 40s. He's been doing this, basically, is the only career he's ever known, and he's still getting rejected. Yeah, he was getting rejected over and over again for different reasons. He never gives he up. Was, he was <laughs> driven you know, to, to write the stuff that he wrote. And like the Call of Cthulhu was rejected the first time he submitted it. A friend of his re- resubmitted it, and then it was accepted. <laughs> um, Farnsworth Wright, the editor to for Weird Tales, was kind of tricky that way. He would just uh-huh. reject things that were great and accept things that were terrible sometimes. <laughs> and so a lot of his stories were initially rejected. At, at the Mountains of Madness, uh, was rejected. And he published that in a different magazine. It was Amazing Stories, I think. Mm-hmm. And eventually he might have left Weird Tales altogether, and he probably would have just completely moved into science fiction writing, but there's no way to know. But that was the direction that he was heading. Certainly, The Shadow Out of Time, his last major story, was a story where you had monsters that were not frightening monsters. The situation mm-hmm. was creepy, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but he he was writing about monsters and he was writing about these aliens, ancient aliens again. And he was writing all about their society and their culture and the way they lived. And it was clear that he admired all of this stuff. This was his ideal society that he was talking about. They were just, you know, monsters living. Mm-hmm. 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 But clearly he wasn't afraid of the monsters. The fear had had left his writing at that point, and he probably would have moved on 
to just writing science fiction. Mm. Mm. But we don't know. No, it would have been would have been interesting because I suppose he he could have lived to see you know men in space. He could have lived to see even men walking on the moon. I mean, he would have been pretty old, but he could have lived that long. So it's it's a shame. And you know, obviously, uh, by the time he publishes Shadow of In In's Mouth, it's 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 nineteen thirty six. He's ill. He doesn't know he's ill though, does he? Because he refuses to visit doctors. He's got a fear of doctors, of course. Like he, like uh, I mean, he probably knows he's ill, but what I mean is he doesn't know what it is. I don't think he um, didn't. He didn't know how bad it was. Mm, mm. Um, eventually, he he did have to see a doctor, and then he learned, and he knew, and mm -hmm. he didn't tell anybody right away how serious it was but by the time uh he was sick he knew he mm -hmm. knew he knew what it was he knew what his eventual fate would be and his fate was pretty grisly it was a terrible end yeah yeah you know for for everybody that slams lovecraft he paid for it mm -hmm. you know? he, mm -hmm. he had a he had a he had a very rough uh death well, I mean, even even the run up to it, because apparently, like, um, it wasn't that long before. I'd say less less than a year. Um, you know, he he loses Robert E. Howard, who I don't know which, how which close was... friends they were, but you know, from what I read, it did have an impact on him. He, kept, you know, because Howard killed himself, didn't he? he shot himself mm -hmm. after he found out his mother's his mother's illness was terminal. She was she was in a coma. She wasn't going to wake up. I, I can't remember, but. You know, he 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 commits suicide, and this leads to uh, Lovecraft actually having some correspondence with Howard's father, I believe. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know that's got to be a blow. And then what? Six, seven months later, you know, Lovecraft himself is is dead. Yeah, so. the, Howard's death deeply affected Lovecraft because they had uh, a very lively correspondence, which is all collected now and you, you, and you could read it. Um, but they were, they were as good of friends as you can be. If you just know somebody through letters. Oh, so they never met face to they face. Never, no, they never met. Um, but they shared so many of their ideas in an intimate way. So they knew each other. Um, they, they had, De hold debates in in their in their letters and also lovecraft recognized how talented robert e howard was and he didn't know how depressed robert e howard was and that was the thing robert e howard probably would have killed himself years earlier mm -hmm. the only reason he was hanging out was because his mother needed him and so once his mother was gone and didn't need him anymore, there was nothing keeping him. Mm -hmm. But Lovecraft didn't know that. And so it just came as a complete blow to him. And uh, yeah, it was, it was devastating. Yeah, I mean, another really interesting and intriguing uh, writer, uh, Robert E. Howard. So I hope perhaps you'll think in the future, maybe you're coming on to talk about uh, talk about him. Thought I'd put you on the spot there. So this, this no is problem. In, in the thing. But um, just, to, just to kind of finish up, because, um, you know, I don't want to keep you too long. Um, his legacy, you know, what, what, what does the world owe Lovecraft? How has he lived on in other life forms? I'm sure... Uh, art forms, sorry, not life forms. Life forms would have been a good thing for him. Um, but, you know, he, he, yeah, how do we come into contact? I think from things like cartoons, like South Park on through music albums and all sorts of stuff have, have, have some legacy. It's hard, it's hard to measure just how extensive his legacy is because he affected so much. I mean, horror was different after Lovecraft wrote. I mean, he, he like I said, he changed everything. Um, and so it's, it's hard to measure the extent, but the, the extent was, was pretty huge. We see Lovecraft everywhere in horror. Um, even people who don't know that they're writing Lovecraftian things sometimes are writing Lovecraftian things just because he was so in influential that, you know, you just see 
the ripple effect of his work everywhere. Well, but I mean, he, he he gave rise to an entire study of his stuff. I mean, Lovecraft studies is a, is a thing. I mean, this we mentioned him before. This St. St. Joshi, uh, you know, this this man is dedicated a huge chunk of his life mm -hmm. looking at the life, well, short life, really, of of H. P. Lovecraft. You know, that's yeah, so and, and it's Lovecraft is one of those one of those writers I could read over and over again and always will because there's just so much in there. He puts so much of himself and so much of his fears and anxieties and uh, his thoughts about philosophy. I mean, everything he put in his writing and he just created this unique body of literature that is just joyfully horrif horrifying. And it's, it's not huge. I mean, the, the amount that he wrote on his own can be, can fit in a big chunky volume. So if you mm. get a complete, you know, the complete fiction of Lovecraft. I mean, that's one volume that you can read. And in that volume, you will find a whole world of horror, which starts off one place and ends up someplace completely different. And yet everything is connected in his work. Mm. He references all kinds of things from different stories. So it's almost, it's almost like a novel in a way mm -hmm. that's mm -hmm. telling a certain kind of, story with all of these reoccurring characters and creatures and beings all connected which is just a fascinating thing and it's just a fascinating body of work and it's it's no wonder that it's influenced so much i mean you have to wonder how much something like that is really you know when did that idea take shape you know i mean that takes again to use the word crafting but it takes crafting to do something like that you know mm -hmm. when did he decide that okay i'm actually going to write a body of work and somehow it's all going to be interconnected you know that's that... i don't i don't know that it was a it was a conscious decision conscious decision because like i said he never came up with the idea of mm -hmm. the Cthulhu mythos for example mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. he was just writing one thing after another but in his mind it was all connected. Everything that he did was connected. He never, I think, imagined that all of his stuff would ever be collected in one volume. I don't think he could ever imagine that. Mm. He thought he would be forgotten. I mean, it's, it's fascinating to think of all those people that have made money out of him mm -hmm. when he didn't make anything. He didn't you know, make anything. No. Um, one last uh, thing on legacy, which we mentioned, I think, before we started recording which I like, is is how does this Arkham House thing play into Batman? Was Arkham House something related to one of um, Lovecraft's actual works that, that they took when they made the Arkham House publishing? Well, they, or? they took the name. Arkham was uh, a city. Okay. It's basically Salem. Uh -huh. And uh, it was his creepy city where all kinds of creepy things happened. And so right. he came up with different cities like Innsmouth he he made up um there was a real Innsmouth but he the one he's talking about he made up and Arkham is his uh main town of uh, okay. uh -huh. and so uh -huh. they used the name for Arkham House and later on uh they used the name for the asylum for all the crazy people are in Batman mm. but yeah you'll you'll find little bits of Lovecraft everywhere in all kinds of different places and very often where you don't expect them. Yeah, I mean, he, he's he was obviously influenced by by things around him because I realized when I read um, Call of Cthulhu that, you know, the, 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 the main character's uncle is like Dr. Angel with two mm -hmm. L's. And then, because I was reading it through one of these uh, Delphi classics, the e-books, mm -hmm. you know, complete works. And then it's like, oh, this is H.P. Uh, Lovecraft's house at something, something Angel Street with mm -hmm. two L's. Yeah. So I, I love I love it when you get things like that. But no, um, it's it's been wonderful. I mean, just just to end end, um, if someone can only read one of his works, what is the best one for a novice like to, to get you started? I mean, I started, as I said, with Call of Cthulhu because the most famous one but if if someone really wants to 
get started? You start at the beginning or where would you start with him? Call of Cthulhu isn't a bad starting point. Um, just because you get a sense of the kind of thing that he writes. It's a good story for one. And you get a sense of the kind of writing that he does, what he's writing about, what he's interested in. Um, it certainly is a cosmic horror story. You could also start uh, with something completely different, like uh, The Color Out of Space, which is just a rock solid science fiction horror story. Also a cosmic horror story, only slightly connected if you feel like connecting these sort of things with the rest of the Cthulhu mythos. Mm -hmm. um, but another great place to start, just because it's such a creepy story. God, that's a creepy story. Anyway, you know, there's there are a few places you can start. Uh, I usually recommend, like, if you're going to pick up a book, you know, I usually recommend the first Penguin volume, The Call of Cthulhu and other weird stories. Mm -hmm. And just read that, mm -hmm. you know, and then you'll know if you like Lovecraft or not, because that one volume has a lot of the different kinds of stories that he wrote. Uh, everything from his Dunsany kind of fantasy kind of stuff to his Edgar Allan Poe inspired stuff to his main stuff, which is the Cthulhu mythos. Um, so if you're just interested, geez, I'm interested in this guy. Where do I start with this writer? Which is tough with a writer who wrote so many different things. Mm -hmm. I would recommend that volume. Penguin did three different volumes. Uh, which if you get those three volumes, you've got everything good. Mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. All of his major stuff is published in those three. And so start with the first one published, which was called Cthulhu and Other Weird Tales. If you read that, you get a good sense of who he was as a writer and whether you like him or not and want to continue. Excellent. Michael, thank you so much for your time. Thank you for this fascinating chat about uh, H.P. Lovecraft. And uh, yeah, thanks so much. Thanks for having me. So there we have it. I hope very much you enjoyed this episode. I certainly enjoyed making it. And uh, I hope you will join us next time. Please do head over to YouTube and check out and subscribe to Michael's channel. That's Michael K. Vaughan. Uh, he's a wonderful booktuber with some amazing content. So thanks again for joining us and we shall see you again soon. Do take care, everybody. Bye bye.